protecting children. Why one advocacy group is raising concerns over the internet app TikTok. Back and forth. Negotiations continue over what should be included in the next coronavirus stimulus package. Faith in politics. A Catholic lawmaker from Ohio tells us about his outreach to people of other religions. And inspiring message how an iconic statue of Christ is showing support for those affected by the deadly explosion in Beirut. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, August 7th, 2020. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. President Donald Trump and Joe Biden offer competing views of the latest job numbers. And the Trump administration promotes help for former prisoners seeking a second chance and tells church leaders how they can help. Correspondent Owen Jensen reports now from the White House. Owen. Tracy, President Trump is not at the White House tonight. Instead, he's in New Jersey this weekend doing some campaign fundraising. And this morning, he got some numbers he clearly likes. The United States added 1.8 million jobs in July, prompting President Donald Trump to tweet great jobs numbers. But Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden responded, while I am grateful for the people who got their jobs back, my heart goes out to the more than 16 million Americans still out of work. The truth is it didn't have to be this bad, but Donald Trump failed to act. He's the one person who should lose his job. White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow spoke with reporters near the West Wing and expects unemployment will be in the single digits by November and calls it a big win. I think the real story is the big drop in unemployment to 10.2. It's down almost a point. Also, TikTok and WeChat. President Trump cracking down on each app over their connection to China's government, issuing executive orders that could bar the apps from the Apple and Google app stores. And we all agree that there needs to be a change, especially with TikTok collecting significant amounts of private data on users. It's unacceptable. Also at the White House. We need the faith community more than we need anybody else right now to step up. Something new called the Reentry Resource Center, a one-stop shop designed for prisoners re-entering society. The head of the Trump administration's initiative tells me places of worship play a big role. We need the faith community more than ever. So we've been holding conference calls around the nation, talking to churches during this pandemic time, uh, how you can get involved with reentry, how you can get involved with Opportunity Zones, how you can get involved with White House Revitalization Council. Also tonight, we're learning that U.S. intelligence officials believe that Russia is trying to denigrate Democrat Joe Biden ahead of the November election, that China does not want President Trump to win because he's too, quote, unpredictable, and that Iran is trying to divide our nation. Tracy? Okay, thank you so much. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reporting for us tonight. Well, the National Center on Sexual Exploitation is issuing its own warnings about TikTok and the potential dangers the social media video app poses for children. Joining me now on Skype to talk more about this is Lena Nealin, Director of Corporate and Strategic Initiatives at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. Lena, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I know TikTok is on your dirty dozen list as a space that can be dangerous for children by exposing them to potential abuse from online predators. What have you discovered in your research? Exactly like you said, we find that TikTok was a predator's hunting ground. Pedophiles were able to watch uh, videos of minors, comment on them, and direct message them, often sending pornographic material and enticing them to send sexually explicit photos, thereby uh, making them prime for grooming and even potentially sex trafficking. So we put TikTok on our Dirty Dozen list, which calls out mainstream entities that are facilitating and profiting from sexual abuse and exploitation. Yeah, and this app is extremely popular with young people and maybe even more so now since many of them are spending a lot of their time on devices during the pandemic. What should parents be on the lookout for and how can we protect our children? So it's just important to know there that where we find children, we find predators. And whether it's TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, all of these apps um, 
are rife with abuse and child sexual abuse materials. So parents really need to be vigilant, informed, and involved in their child's online life. And as you said, our children are online and ever more so. So as any parent, I'm a parent of four, you wanna make sure that you're talking to, their, to your kids, that they're making good decisions when you aren't there and that they can come to you when they're seeing things that um, are not right on these social media platforms. Lena, what type of safeguards would you like to see on TikTok put in place for the younger users? So for TikTok and for any social media app, right now, corporations really are not prioritizing our children's safety. And so we would like to see corporations um, take more initiative, for example, setting privacy, privacy mode as a default for minors. Right now, most defaults are public, which does allow strangers to contact minors. Um, TikTok did, after our advocacy, instill something called family safety mode, which allows parents much more oversight into what's happening on their children's um, TikTok account. Um, and so these kinds of safeguards are possible. And again, corporations aren't prioritizing it. So parents need to be vigilant and the government needs to hold corporations accountable. And luckily, we do have a bipartisan bill that's before Congress called the Earn It Act which does stop that broad immunity from liability that corporations have enjoyed. So again, there's a lot that can be done, um, but a lot, more, a lot more needs to be done. Well, Lena, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Lena Nealon, Director of Corporate and Strategic Initiatives at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. Thanks again. Thank you. A former Vice President Joe Biden wades into controversy over how he discusses race and ethnicity. The presumptive Democratic nominee for president told a Latina reporter earlier this week that unlike the African-American community, Hispanics are, quote, an incredibly diverse community. He later clarified the remark, saying that he did not intend to cast black Americans as a monolith. Uh, we are still very far apart. That is the latest word from Capitol Hill as lawmakers continue to negotiate on the latest corona relief bill. My frustration uh, is, is that we could have passed a very uh, skinny deal that dealt with some of the most pressing issues. We should do something and we should do something big and we should do it in a way that is bipartisan as we have done every other bill. One big sticking point is to give aid to state and local governments as they struggle to stay afloat financially after the coronavirus pandemic crushed the U.S. economy and left millions jobless. The best and really only good way to help the American people is a broad, strong, bipartisan agreement. If uh, the Democrats are willing to compromise and do something, I think we'll get something done. Administration officials say President Trump may take executive action if a deal is not completed by tonight. At least 14 people are dead after a plane skidded off the runway and split in half while landing in heavy rain in southern India. The wreck also injured dozens of passengers. 15 are now in critical condition. The flight was carrying citizens of India back into the country. The United Nations is warning of a looming food crisis in Lebanon as the U.S. military sends three cargo planes packed with food, water and medicine to Beirut. French and Russian rescue teams are searching for survivors. Three days after the explosion, entire neighborhoods are devastated. The cleanup continues with hundreds of volunteers. The Vatican says it has sent 250,000 euros to the church in Lebanon following the disaster. And coming up later in the show, how a Catholic charity is helping those affected by the deadly explosion. The Catholic leader of Hong Kong is getting slapped with sanctions by the United States for cracking down on human rights in Hong Kong. Today, the Treasury Department imposed sanctions on Carrie Lam, as well as Hong Kong's police chief and nine other pro-China officials in Hong Kong. The sanctions are the latest in a string of actions the Trump administration has taken against China. Lam is a devout Catholic and has refused to join the Communist Party. People in Sri Lanka celebrate the Rajapaksa brothers winning elections.
They won in a landslide, giving them nearly two-thirds majority in parliament. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa is expected to be sworn into the same position by his younger brother, President Gadabaya Rajapaksa. The elections appear to strengthen their dynastic rule on the island nation. Well, the United States and NATO are already withdrawing troops from Afghanistan. But final peace talks with the Taliban cannot begin until Afghanistan frees 400 prisoners. Today, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani convened a grand council, or what is called Loya Jirga. They're deciding if the last 400 Taliban prisoners should be released. Then the final peace talks on a constitution and rights for women can start. The Australian state of Victoria was locked down after a sharp rise in COVID-19 cases last month. But this week, officials say the infection rate has been, quote, relatively flat. In early July, they declared a state of disaster and closed borders with the rest of Australia for the first time in 100 years. Health officials today say the infection rate is reasonable. During the coronavirus pandemic, Pope Francis has sent aid to almost 200 charitable projects in Latin America and the Caribbean. The Vatican's COVID task force is overseeing these donations and assisting the church worldwide in facing the pandemic. Joining us now is Father Christopher Mahar of the Healthcare Services Office in the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. He is also part of the Vatican's COVID Task Force Working Group. Father, welcome to the program. Great to have you on. So tell us, how is the task force assisting the Holy Father in sending out donations around the world? And also, where is that money coming from? Uh, thank you, Tracy. It's a um, it's a great uh, great question. First of all, the the task force is gathering money from those who are willing to be generous in their donations and their charitable works at this time, especially um, being struggling in so different so many different nations throughout the world. There are everyone is is struggling with this, right? So so it's hard for people to be generous, perhaps. Um, at the point of their greatest need. But, but that's only one of the work groups that's helping us right at this time. So the, the task force is actually set up with also a communications piece, trying to reach out to others about what the good news is, about how the church is responding really well. Um, my part is, the, is part of work group one, which is the listening group. So we're trying to listen to the local church and find out where people are in their own struggle in the local church. And so we've been listening to religious congregations that are working in health care. We've been meeting with chaplains, both in prisons as well as hospitals. Um, we've had uh, video conferences with bishops throughout the world that have helped us to get a good sense of where that struggle is locally and how they're responding many different ways throughout the world. Uh, you just mentioned that you've been reaching out to the bishops. What are you hearing from them? And then also, what are the major concerns? Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, the, the, what we're hearing ma mainly is obviously a great concern of the shepherds of the church um, for the, the health care itself. So, so people that are really struck by this global pandemic, obviously it starts there with the public health crises. But more than that, they're also telling us about some of the vulnerabilities, some of the struggles that people already had going in. So with poverty, uh, with places in the world that are really struggling economically, uh, with inequalities, with a lot of the injustice that happens in the world, uh, the, the COVID coronavirus crisis has exacerbated that. And so they're telling us that, that, that many people really need help um, in a particular way um, not just with material help, which is what we're trying to do for them as well, but also the great message of the church's hope. You know, Pope Francis is focusing in these days in his catechesis on faith, hope, and charity. So this is the spiritual solidarity with the poor that we're trying to communicate for those that are most in need. Father, um, also just curious, what do you think is the one thing that people are really needing right now? I would say hope. Tracy, I think people really need hope. In some of the places that we've listened to um, in parts of the world that are not particularly Christian um, at, at this point, or, or perhaps they have a Christian background um, that are struggling to make that a reality, uh, whether it be very, very deeply immersed in their faith or people that don't have faith at all, they're struggling to find hope, which means we have a future. And Pope Francis has been very clear for us, we are here to prepare the future, which he says is different from preparing for the future. So Pope Francis is very clear about that. To prepare for the future means that there's a grim reality that's coming towards us, 
And it's sort of a, um, a, a fatalism that there's nothing we can do to change that. To prepare the future, Pope Francis has been very clear, is to have hope. It's to realize, you know, that our choices today, because of the supernatural grace of God, faith, hope, and charity that are present, and Pope Francis has done beautifully with this in his own catechesis this past Wednesday, we'll continue to reflect on that, that, that the supernatural grace of God and these theological virtues help us to live well the Church's social teaching. So we see solidarity as being one with the poor. We see solidarity as sharing the great resources, material and spiritual, with those who are most in need. But we don't just ask for that. We make it a reality by acting and moving forward in faith, trusting that the Holy Spirit will be there to engage us as we do that. Well, Father, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Father Christopher Mahar of the Healthcare Services Office in the Deck History for promoting integral human development. Thank you again, Father. You're welcome, Tracy. Thank you. Coming up, an update on the efforts to help the people in Beirut following the deadly explosion. Plus, a Catholic member of Congress makes a request of Attorney General William Barr. We'll explain. The Catholic charity Aid to the Church in Need is sending an emergency food aid package to Lebanon in the wake of this week's devastating explosion in Beirut. Authorities in Lebanon have declared the city a disaster and imposed a state of emergency following the massive blast that killed more than 130 people, wounded thousands, and destroyed buildings for miles around. It is estimated some 300,000 people are unable to return to their homes. Joining me now on Skype to talk more about Catholic relief efforts in Lebanon is Edward Clancy. He is the Director of Outreach for Aid to the Church in Need USA. Edward, welcome back to the show. Thanks for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. Well, this is such a terrible tragedy, as we know, and I know that food and shelter is really a top priority right now for so many people that are displaced. Tell us a little bit more about your emergency food package. How much are you sending and who are you directing the aid to? Well, we're sending uh, $300,000 worth of aid. Uh, it, it will initially help about 5,000 families. We know that the, the number affected is over 250, close to 300,000. So there will be more aid in the future. But the first thing was to get an initial um, package on the ground to help people immediately and see what happens after that. What do we know exactly about the impact this explosion has had on the Christian quarter of Beirut? And have you heard from the faithful there? And if so, what are they saying? It is, uh, the, the area is called uh, Akrafia. It's the uh, Christian stronghold. And it was a, at one point a very um, prominent area of, uh, of Beirut. And it has been in a, a Christian center for, for generations. And the issue is that it is almost completely devastated. There are thousands of buildings, you know, unlivable. The the the, the dirt, the the land, everything is covered with silt that's toxic. Uh, they're worried about the water supply. There's no power. There's uh, no just general uh, conditions of life there. And so the, the Christian community now is is struggling just to reassess. Uh, there are hundreds still missing. Uh, today we found out that a young man named Joseph was recovered, his body was recovered, and he was clutching a cross. And uh, the director of youth services for the archdiocese, Monsignor uh, Tufik Budhadir, said uh, of him that he was watering the cedars with his blood, because the phrase there for the young Christians is to water the cedars, to, to keep Christianity alive. And many of them have, have, you know, pledged to stay, even though conditions are very difficult. Yeah, in recent years, I know that you know that Lebanon has become home to a large number of Syrian and Iraqi refugees, and many of them Christian, as well as Palestinian refugees. Do we know yet how it's affected directly those communities? Well, a friend of mine who visits Lebanon often said to me, uh, if you go to Lebanon and you haven't met uh, a refugee, you haven't gotten off the plane. Probably one in three people who reside in Lebanon are refugees, close to two million million, 1.8 million of the 5.9 million people that live there. 
So these refugees are, are there because everywhere else is not good. You know, the Iraqis, hundred thousands of uh, Iraqi, there's uh, 1.5 million Syrians, and the conditions there are terrible. And one of the other problems with uh, uh, the problems in Lebanon is now it makes it even harder to help Syria because Lebanon had been sort of a port of entry, a way of getting help into the Syrian Christians. And now with this, it's decimated even that. It's become extremely difficult for, for the refugees. And uh, in addition to praying, which we are doing for everyone there right now, what else can we do to help? Well, if you visit our website, it will keep you up to date. Uh, we are doing uh, uh, extensive drives, you know, aid to the church in need.org. Um, and you can see ways of helping. We, we, we mentioned that $300,000 was sent. We will send more. We're, going, we're not going to let them, uh, you know, go without our help. It's important to us. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for what you do. Edward Clancy, Director of Outreach for Aid to the Church in Need USA. Thanks again. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me as always. A Catholic member of Congress is asking the U.S. Attorney General to respond to recent attacks on churches around the country. Representative Chuck Fleischman, a Republican from Tennessee, says he is asking the Justice Department to condemn any act of vandalism on any house of worship for any religion. The Knights of Columbus says it is preparing a report on Christian persecution in Nigeria. Over the past two decades, it is believed at least 60,000 Christians have been killed in the country. The Knights of Columbus helps support EWTN News Nightly. Up next, God, faith, and politics. A U.S. congressman talks about his Catholic faith and how it's influenced his time on Capitol Hill. In tonight's Faith and Politics, since 2007, Congressman Bob Lada has represented the people of Ohio's 5th Congressional District. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales spoke with him about the influence his Catholic faith has on how he votes and serves on Capitol Hill. Spending a little time with Congressman Bob Lada, you soon realize being a U.S. lawmaker is not about fame or power to him, but it's about making a difference and protecting one's faith, life, and liberties which our country was founded on. First, that, that major building block is God. And then you can't have a family without God, and you can't have a country without a family and God. So you have to have all three together. Congressman Bob Lotta tells me each morning he opens and reads the Word of God. None of us are perfect. You know, our founders weren't perfect. We're all imperfect. But we have to have that faith, and that's why it's important to me. It's just like every day that I, I start off by reading from the Bible. Growing up, his mother was Catholic and his father belonged to the Church of Christ. Congressman Lada says he learned early on to never put down another religion, finding a common ground. It's the same philosophy he's taken on Capitol Hill. Just like his father, Delbert, did, serving in Congress from 1959 to 1989. What we used to do, we'd live part of the year here. I'd go to the first uh, part of school at home, and the dad finds a place to live for five months here. I said, you don't know what it's like back in the late 50s, early 60s, that the roads weren't as great as they were, but you were with your parents. We drove back and forth maybe twice a month. And when you're in the car with your parents for 18 hours over a weekend, <laughs> you got to know everyone quite well. Congressman Lotto says family is everything, and so is fighting for those who can't speak for themselves like the unborn. Life is, a, is absolutely precious, and we want to make sure that we do everything we possibly can through the legislation that I have, making sure that uh, when you think of chemical abortions and, and uh, you know, making sure that we don't see an expansion there, we, say that more, we want to make sure that we protect life. Congressman Lotta shared with me the story about his daughter being born premature and how God answered their prayers. He tells me as long as the people of Ohio want him here, he will continue to fight for the sanctity of life. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. One other Catholic congressman that we featured on our Faith and Politics series has tested positive for the coronavirus. Illinois Representative Rodney Davis is resting at home. He tells EWTN that he feels fine and the only symptom that he has is a higher than normal temperature. 
The congressman's wife, as well as the staff that he worked with this week, have all tested negative. And finally tonight, Brazil honors the victims of the Beirut explosion. The Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio is lit up with the flag of Lebanon. It is to honor the victims of Tuesday's blast that destroyed the port in Beirut. In a ceremony at the statue, a Catholic priest and an Eastern Catholic bishop joined a diplomat from Lebanon to offer prayers for the victims of the explosion. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.